So without any further ado, Ethan Nadelman. Thank you very much, Pat. Um, yeah, it's a long time, long time. Um, and I should say, I've come here on a bit of a high because um, my organization, Drug Policy Alliance, we just organized the biennial International Drug Policy Reform Conference just outside D.C. in Arlington, Virginia last week, and it was incredible. I mean, there were 1,500 people there, 71 countries, uh, far bigger, more dynamic, dealing with really difficult issues, but in a loving and supportive way. And it just, it, it, it's a, we're going through a period right now of some sense of optimism and growth in the United States. Um, and so that's going to uh, you know, shape a, a little what I say here. Now, um, you know, my, my friend Carl opened this up, right, by talking about, you know, tra you know he and I traveling here on Delta a couple nights ago and, and you know, my, my pathological um, optimism. Um, so I decided I'm going to be really pessimistic with my talk here now. <laughs> you know, you need some balance, you know. But, <laughs> but and, and, and I also will say that in what I'm about to say here, you know, I mean, just, I understand, you know, I'm American. I come from New York. I come from the center of the universe, right? <laughs> Um, I speak without an accent. I'm doing my best with all of you, right? Um, you know, so, so I understand that the natural tendency of us Americans to sort of, you know, come off, be, and even be arrogant. So let me preface this by just saying that anything that I'm offering right now is not in the, any sense the sense of you should do this, you should do that, whatever. It's barely in the frame of suggestions, right? It's more in the idea of throwing out ideas and reflections about what's happening here and what's happening in my own country and around the world, and especially in this very dark and difficult period that England is in right now, um, what might be useful to all of you coming from the places that you're coming from and, and thinking and hoping the way that you do. I should also say this is my first time in Liverpool. Um, I've never been here before. And in a way, for me, coming to Liverpool, it's like coming to Mecca. You know, because I remember when I was just starting out, you know, in, still in academia, late 80s, early 90s, and then it was Liverpool in a place I'd never heard of called Merseyside, but that's your county. I mean, you know, and there was, you know, you know Pat O'Hare and, and Alan Parry and Alan Matthews, and there was John Marks and there were others people, and it was like this amazing sort of new elements, dynamic elements of harm reduction bubbling out of here. And so it was odd that I never came because I traveled all throughout Europe to any sort of hot spot, but somehow never landed up here, but understanding that this is really the birthplace of, of much of harm reduction, and certainly in the Anglophone world, the birthplace of harm reduction in a very important and powerful way, and that, and that would pat and the amazing O'Hare sisters are doing with HIT and this HIT conference and bringing you all together here. I mean, this is in the, you know, just as they were pioneers in the dark days that you're going through now, the amazing value of them and of this organization, this conference, I just hope it can find ways to keep continuing and keep bringing people together. So it's, it's absolutely pivotal. So let me, um, you know, first I should say that for me, going back to the 80s when I was still studying all of this stuff and in academia, and I felt like I was making my regular pilgrimages to Europe, to, uh, to Amsterdam and Rotterdam and to Frankfurt and to, and to England to some extent and to, you know, Bern and to, and to Geneva and to, and to Zurich, you know, really seeing what people were doing. The early days of heroin maintenance, the early days of safe injection sites, you know, seeing a different way of dealing with this stuff, understanding that even when Europe began to mimic the American drug court model, it was still doing it in a fundamentally different way. And when I left academia to create what was first called the Lindesmith Center and then the Drug Policy Alliance, the real mission was to try to educate my fellow Americans about better ways, more science-based, more human rights-based, more fiscally responsible, more compassionate ways of dealing with drugs and to teach about what was going on in Europe. 
Now, of course, the great frustration, of course, is that Americans really have absolutely no interest in what's happening outside our country. I mean, you know, we're separated by two, by two oceans. You know, we're a big country in our own right. I mean, we're sort of like the French, but worse. You know, I mean, it, it, it's, it, it, it's, it, it, and, and so there was not really the market for that. I mean, there was a sense in which we did it anyway, and we, ha we had no choice but to follow in your footsteps on things like needle exchange and, uh, you know, and other elements of harm reduction. But the fact that it was working abroad, even today there remains this remarkable resistance to Americans learning about this stuff. You know, my, my, my colleagues at, at Drug Policy Alliance, DPA, they, um, you know, they, they, they think I'm obsessed with like trying to get safe injection sites or heroin maintenance going in the U.S. 20 years, 10 years after it's happened already, you know, on the other side of the ocean. But I, these are areas where we continue to fall tragically short and where you guys have led the way. Um, so much of what, when I think about, you know, the British system, you have so much to build on. You know, the tradition of physician independence and prescribing, and even though it's been circumscribed here, that tradition that allowed physicians to prescribe heroin or cocaine going back almost 100 years, uh, that notion that this should be between a doctor and his patient was something that was pivotal. One of the awards we give out, the award for achievement um, that we give out at our biennial conference for law enforcement is called the Bing Spear Award, named after the police officer in the home office, right, you know, who, you know, in the 1950s, 60s, whatever, you know, more or less knew the names of most of the injecting drug users in the city of London and whose priority was not to put them in jail. It was to try to make sure they were staying out of trouble and staying alive and, you know, to to understand that they were human beings. Uh, I know that Margaret Thatcher was a very difficult personality and leader for so many here, but the fact that her government came out with, a, or at least supported the statement that we needed to prioritize stopping the spread of HIV above all else in 1985, even coming from all the other places that she and her government were coming from, the fact that that position was embraced early on Right? It wasn't just Australia and the Netherlands, but even in the UK, even under her, that that actually was a way that we could go back to conservatives in our own country and say that some of this stuff was possible. So, you know, there is this tradition in this country to build upon. And when I talk to people in the pub last night and talk to Pat and hear things this morning and hear how bad it is here right now, I mean, the decimation of resources, the demonization of people who use drugs, uh, you know, the sense of fear of people trying to do the right thing here, the indifference to human life that this government currently is demonstrating. Um, I know that place very well because I have lived and worked in America virtually all of my life. And it is my own country which I love dearly and which has manifested these extraordinarily horrible things in our society in dealing with people who use drugs for a very long time and also propagated and advanced and pressured other uh, governments around the world and shaped international conventions to reflect our harsh and punitive and paranoid views. So I'm not coming from a place of um, easy acceptance of harm reduction, shall we say. And when I come here and sounding like England is now sounding like the deep south in my own country, you know, I, I, I have a sense of what it is that you're, that you're dealing with. I should also say that, and please, you know, really don't take these as criticisms, take them as reflections, because I just don't know enough about what's going on day to day, month to month, on the ground here and elsewhere. Um, but, one of the things I find myself doing in the United States as people are in this sort of celebratory mood about advances in certain areas is saying, wait a second, hold on, hold on. You know, we didn't win yet. It's not in the bag yet, right? Uh, even the marijuana legalization thing, we're not there yet. Even if we got a majority of public opinion and momentum on our side and all these sorts of things, we're not there yet. And I remind people that there was a period before I got involved in all this in the late 70s, which was a sort of sweet spot in American drug policy. 
It was post the Nixon drug wars. It was pre the era of Ronald Reagan. It was the Jimmy Carter days. It was when the radicalism of the 60s and the culture conflict of the 60s had been replaced by the uh, live and let live spirit of the 70s. And it was a time when marijuana was all of a sudden decriminalized in 11 states and people thought we were on the way to national decriminalization, even legalization. It was a period when harm reduction, not yet called harm reduction, but a public health perspective was actually supported by the federal government and by leading foundations. It was a period when there was innovative and good scholarship about not just drug abuse, but drug use, really a sort of flowering of, of good ideas, right? And, and then and on the marijuana thing, which was in some respect typical of the rest, there was, I remember there being a period, 1979, the annual survey of college freshmen, how many of you would support legalizing, not decriminalizing, but legalizing marijuana? 51% said yes. And then jump forward to 1989, eight years not just of the Reagan administration, but of a bipartisan drug war. And that same survey of college freshmen 10 years later showed that 16% supported legalizing marijuana. The notion that as generations age, the older generation dies off with all their backward views and newer generation will inevitably be, be more enlightened, there was nothing at all inevitable about that that actually the, the 60s radicalism and 70s live and let live was replaced by a 1980s generation of conformism and some elements of fear and conservatism in ways that were actually counterproductive. And I have to reflect at times, were there things that we did wrong or our predecessors did that we could have done better? Was there a sense of overconfidence among my predecessors in the late 70s about the inevitability of progress? Was there an indifference to the consequences of increasing adolescent misuse of marijuana and dismissing those concerns, right? And I look now here in Europe, whether it's in England or elsewhere, and I sometimes worry about what might be called the complacency of success. It's when we appear to be winning, when our views and our funding priorities appear to be embraced by government, and turns out it's not quite so strong and steady as we suspected. I see in Western Europe, which is many parts have not rolled back the way they have in England, but you know, one of the things that come with success is that once one, you look at what's happened, for example, in part, many parts of Western Europe, which in the late 80s, where you know, open air drug markets, all sorts of craziness, you know, drug related crime, all things like that. And they responded very aggressively and innovatively with innovative harm reduction policies. The European Cities on Drug Policy, EDCP, rallied around something called the Frankfurt Resolution, right? The, the cities, mostly the port cities, advanced sensible policies. They got through it, the police began to buy in, heroin maintenance, expanded access to opioid, other opioid substitution. Am I speaking too quickly, by the way? Tell me if I am, because uh, uh, raise your hand, I'll try to slow down. But um, anyway, I'll keep going at this rate then. Um, and it was all good. And then what I see is that the spirit of reform kind of faded. It's like we got the good stuff going. But OK, we're going to keep cannabis illegal. OK, we got this far in harm reduction, and that's enough. We got to dealing with substitution with the opiates up to a point. But what we're going to do with the stimulants, well, was sort of the same old policies, right? There was a sense in which people sort of were self-satisfied. And what I do, because I don't know enough about what's going on in England here, but I think in a situation like that, I'm not saying that people here were self-satisfied. But it goes to the point of that even when one is in a good position and one needs to keep pushing further for the next set of reforms, the things that follow logically from the reforms we've achieved, you need to play good defense as well. And oftentimes the best offense, they say, is a good defense. It's remembering that just because we sometimes get the government bureaucrats and others to endorse our policies around things, it doesn't mean we're locked in. It doesn't mean the forces that advocated for punitive policies are dead and gone with. It just means that they are kind of on their own defensive for a while, but all the ready to come back. And that in moments of fear or weakness, those policies that we thought were part of history can once again become the future and the present, as they are now in England. There will come a time again in England when there will be harm reduction triumphant again. 
But we'll need to remember the next time around that even as we keep trying to push the envelope as we must, we need to keep addressing the fears and concerns of those people who opposed us. Not just say, we beat you, we won now, go away, convert, that's it. It's to keep addressing those concerns. Now, let me say a little about the activism in the US. And I just don't know how relevant it is. We're so different in so many ways. You know, our society is, in America, is, you know, kind of the, for better and worse, the model of the dynamic capitalist society with all the goods and all the evils of that. It means we have a world which is a country which is far less fair and just when it comes to how we deal with class and how we deal with poverty. It also means that we have a tradition of philanthropy, which you don't have here. And I have to acknowledge the extent to which much of what helps drive the global drug policy reform movement, and in the US as well, are a small number of very wealthy people coming both from the left and the right who have been persuaded or who have realized that they needed to support this cause. So I realize that tradition is not here in the same way, the ability to engage in that sorts of activism. It seems oftentimes in Europe where government plays a much stronger and bigger role in society, not just on the punitive side. Actually, in America, we sort of excel at that. But in terms of the helping side, but maybe that results in a sense of people expecting government to do things, people expecting government officials and others to do that. In America, we have more of this tradition, I think, of activism, right? Of organizing, of doing what needs to be done and of having to think strategically from the outside, of seeing government to some extent as something of an enemy or something that must be co-opted or moved or forced. And that even if we start off with almost no power, the questions of how we aggregate power and do that and think of, you know, strategically. And then even when we begin to have government reflect our views, we know that, you know, beware of co-optation, beware of having get to get a third of your loaf that government's embracing and then lose, you know, and begin to develop personal relationships with people in government and then you start to oppose them and keep challenging them. Now for us in the US, you know, we came out of this horrific drug war of the late 80s, early 90s and in many respects it still continues as a horrific drug war. Our rates of incarceration, I mean you've all heard it, you know, in America less than 5% of the world's population but almost 25% of the world's incarcerated population, right, the highest per capita rate of incarceration in the world and in the history of democratic societies. Higher than the rate of incarceration in Russia. Locking up more people than China with five times our population does, right? Something locking up black and brown people at rates that far exceed anything that happened in apartheid South Africa or even in the incarceration rates in the gulags of the Soviet Union in the middle of the last century. So we've done something, and that also something, by the way, not consistent with, with American history. I mean, 40, 50 years ago, our incarceration rates were roughly at the world average. This was very much a modern phenomenon driven by the war on drugs in the 80s and 90s and perpetuated through a whole host of other means in recent years. So we needed to think as activists strategically. We, as you, always needed to speak truth to power to take back what we did by the science, right? You know, on the evidence, on the science, much of it being produced across the country here, right? But we also had to think about how do we shift public views? Remember back in the mid-90s, almost 20 years ago, a couple of public opinion polls, and they found that there were two issues on which a majority of Americans felt the drug war had gone too far. One of them was that people who were arrested for possession of any drug and addicted should be given an opportunity, not one, but at least two attempts at treatment. Now, what Americans defined as treatment wasn't very pretty, but at least they believed they should not be sent to jail or prison. And that was one thing. We were able to run a ballot initiative in 96 in Arizona and break through a little bit. But the thing that caught the lion's share of the attention was the one that many of you are aware of, which was on medical marijuana, right? Back 20 years ago, 30% of Americans favored the legalization of marijuana. Over 60% were opposed and others were undecided. But by moving on the issue of cannabis reform, by running on the issue of medical marijuana, we did something quite remarkable. 
we change the nature of the debate. In America, when we organized, first it was local, I should say how it happened, it was local activists drafting a ballot initiative with no hope of getting it on, contacting me who had happened to be in contact with some of the very wealthy men who cared about this issue for different reasons, organizing a professional campaign and winning the legalization of medical marijuana in 1996. What we did right then was we showed that we could play ball in the big leagues of American politics for the first time. We showed people we could win something. What else did we do? We transformed the imagery of who was the marijuana consumer. You know, for years before that, whenever the issue of marijuana legalization came up, I was a Princeton professor, we had a mayor of Baltimore, we had famous conservatives like William Buckley and, and Milton Friedman, but whenever the news media did a thing about marijuana, they would pull out a photograph from their stockpile of photos of some 17-year-old, you know, kid with, you know, blonde dreadlocks and hemp leaves in his hair, and that was the image of the marijuana user, even though that was not the typical marijuana user. Well, our campaign resulted in shifting the image to be somebody an older woman having just come out of chemotherapy for breast cancer, a person dealing with a wasting syndrome of AIDS, a person in a wheelchair dealing with multiple sclerosis. When those people began to become the face of the victim of the drug war, the face of the person we wanted to help, when those people began to show up and testify in legislative hearings, and even cold-hearted right-wing Republicans would have tears coming down their, streaks at the, their cheeks at the plight of these people, that helped to touch not just minds but hearts in a very important way. And mind you, we built coalitions, right? When you looked at the, when you looked at the people who funded these initiatives, the people who organized, and the people who supported who voted for them, a third of them, or half of them I should say, were in it because they supported the broader legalization of marijuana. And the other half weren't interested in the broader legalization of marijuana. They were just interested in helping people for real medical purposes. But the key was we focused on what we had in common, which was changing this policy for them. Right? And then we reproduced it. And we and reproduced it. And, we, and one of the really fascinating public opinion polls we did a few years ago as public opinion began to climb and make the idea of legalizing marijuana not just but for medical but for broader, more realistic. We were trying to figure out how you could predict who would vote to legalize marijuana. And as you would expect, the more recently you've consumed cannabis, the more likely you are to support legalization, right? You got high yesterday, you're more likely to support legalization. If it's been the last few weeks, you know, and if you've never, the least likely. And if it's been 10 years, less likely, right? Then we ask the question, do you know somebody who uses marijuana? Thinking that might be a predictor of who would support legalization. But it wasn't. Because if you're in the marijuana using world, it would be. But if you're not in the marijuana using world, I think this is what was going on. When you say, do you know somebody who uses marijuana, the first person you think of might be, you know, your friend's kid who seems to be, you know, screwing up in school and he's obviously a pothead. So for the people in that other world, knowing somebody who used marijuana, the image came to be somebody who's problematic. Then we ask the question, do you know somebody who uses marijuana medically? If you said yes to that question, whether or not you yourself consume marijuana, that was the best predictor of all of who would support the broader legalization of marijuana. Knowing somebody personally who used it medically helped lead people to support the broader legalization of marijuana. That's not a result that you might expect, but it helped influence our thinking, right? That sometimes things are very indirect in the ways they play out. I'll tell you another indirect one. After we won that first initiative in California in 96, Within the next few years, almost every TV program, the com you know, fictional ones, both dramas and comedies, landed up weaving medical marijuana into the storyline of an episode, either for laughs or for tears, right? I have no way of measuring the impact of that, but I am convinced that the way in which the entertainment media integrated our issue in there in very human, real-life ways for laughs and for tears, helped open this up and normalize this thing in an incredibly important way. You know, if you look at the evolution, because if you look at the Gallup polls, one of our most famous public opinion polls, the Gallup poll, and you line up the Gallup poll in support for legalizing gay marriage, marriage equality, and support for legalizing marijuana, they line up almost exactly. 
since, nine, since 2004, right? From roughly 33 percent or so in 2004 to roughly 53 percent, you know, more recently. Right? And if you think what happened with the evolution in how people were perceived around, you know, around homosexuality, right? 50 years ago, everybody in America knew a homosexual. They just didn't know they knew a homosexual. Right? And therefore, their image of who was a homosexual was shaped by what they saw in the media or who got arrested or who was outrageously effeminate or dressed up. In, you know, I mean, it wasn't people they knew. Right? Now, of course, everybody in America and your country knows a homosexual, they know a gay or lesbian person, and they know now is actually their colleague or their friend or their sister or brother or whatever it might be, and it's transformed public opinion. And if you look at, in the entertainment media, once again, it's gone from the gay person not even being in the entertainment media to then being 30 years ago the very flamboyantly effeminate person to now not even being part of the storyline. They just happen to be gay. And the similar thing has happened with respect to the marijuana consumer, right? It's gone from not even been or demonized a la reefer madness to sort of cheech and chong outrageousness to the troubled marijuana user to the, and now to the point where it's just a background to the storyline, right? So it now raises the issue of how in America our remarkable success with legalizing marijuana to the point where now America bizarrely, the United States bizarrely leads the world. <laughs> I mean, I, I've been traveling around the world speaking for 25 years now, and I almost always, and I can do it right here, start off by apologizing as an American for the incredible harm that my country has inflicted on the rest of the world with our global war on drugs. You know, I especially do that a lot in America and the Caribbean, but it's, it's due all around the world. And I try to still remember to do that because it's still true. But then I got to say, I'm proud to be an American. <laughs> You know, because what we're doing on cannabis reform is inspiring and transformative. And it's not only that we're providing a model for people outside the world, and not only that people in Latin America, the Caribbean, are moving forward on medical marijuana and talking about legalization, and that we're giving a kick in the butt to the complacent Europeans who are sort of resting on their laurels and thinking, well, we got the Dutch system, and, you know, now, and then all of a sudden, Uruguay, or America and Uruguay are leapfrogging Europe and doing innovative stuff. And it's also the fact that when, 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 when the Obama administration in this two years ago gave gave Colorado and Washington a qualified green light to implement their legalization laws even though they were formally in violation of federal law and the international conventions, that when the Obama administration did that, then they sort of, just to be fair about it, had to afford the same courtesy to other governments as they were affording to their own states. And that created an historic transformation in U.S. global drug control policy, where now the U.S. speaks about having a flexible interpretation of the international anti-drug conventions and supporting a diversity in approaches and tolerance for diverse approaches. It's a monumental shift a monumental shift that's opened up tremendous running room and, and a room for countries who used to defer to the international conventions like they were the gospel and the, you know, they're all of a sudden realizing there's this flexibility and even America says so, right? Ethan, so, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, you got it. The question now that we struggle with is what's the connection between marijuana law reform and the rest of drug policy reform? Now, as we define the objective in, for my organization, it is, as we say, to make the most of marijuana exceptionalism while minimizing its negative consequences and maximizing its synergies. To make the most of marijuana exceptionalism to advance the legalization as quickly as possible because that's still half the drug arrests in our country and the same racial disproportionality that we see with the other drugs while minimizing the negative consequences of that exceptionalism. In other words, always making sure never to have, I'm lecturing always my marijuana-only allies not to demonize other drug users as part of all this stuff, and trying to keep this movement together, and then at the same time to maximize the synergies, right? To, under, to see what are the ways in which our advances on marijuana law reform can help advance other drug policy reforms. And we see, for example, the sense of momentum that the media depicts on marijuana reform begins to carry over to the other drugs in a sense where people think it's all of the same thing. We, we, we said, the, the notion of thinking creatively about how to deal with the new psychoactive substances gets opened up a bit because of what's happening on marijuana legalization and all the debates around that. So I know that, I mean, my sense 
sense here, tell me if I'm wrong, is that in England and in much of Europe, there's a real disconnect. Cannabis over here, other drugs over here, right? And that there's also not the dynamism around this thing. But I wonder if there's some potential for some greater synergies between cannabis law reform and the other areas of drug law reform. You know, it seems not in the same way part of the culture here, or the political culture, but it's at least something to think about. Right? We've always, you know, just as the harm reduction conference in the U.S. make an effort to include some element of marijuana, and in the U.S. for drug policy reform, we try desperately to keep integrating these things together, to let people working in these areas or with people struggling with other drugs to be part of this. And when we put up and when Carl points out to others that it's not just with cannabis that most consumers don't have a problem, but it's also with the other drugs that most people don't have a problem, right? It's understanding that. And it was also understanding that just as with marijuana, some people do have a problem because people can become addicted to marijuana. Well, we shouldn't think about that dependence so radically different as that one, even though we're talking about a substance that in many respects is less problematic. I just throw that out to you to see what you might want to do with that. Now, the other things, we've been talking a lot this morning about anger and what we do with anger and how we channel it. And we know, of course, that when disempowered people are angry, unless they're organized or effectively finding ways to challenge that, they sometimes find themselves being pushed back even f further because people are scared of disempowered people who are angry and angry in their faces. The simple articulation of anger, right? Uh, what does it mean to be an advocate is not just to say what you think, to be an effective advocate means to use your words and your language in such a way that it moves other people to do what you want them to do. It's the use of language to attain objective. It is never advocacy purely as self-expression. Self-expression, be a poet. Keep a diary. Yell at your dog. Right? But I mean, when we're talking about advocacy, we're talking about changing the way people in power and structures deal. And it means that. Now, what we also know is that much of what drives our opposition, it's not just, I mean, there's a small number of people who are truly venal and hateful and who really, you know, fuck them. <laughs> but when they're in power, when they're in power, we got a problem. And what puts them in power typically is fear. Fear is the driving element of the war on drugs. Fear is the driving element of much of what you're dealing with, I believe, here. Fear. It is the fear of every parent about their child and what that new drug might do to them. It is the fear of white people, you know, encountering increasingly diverse societies and not knowing how to deal with this diversity, whether it's in Europe or America or around the rest of the world. It's fear of the sort that was prompted by the horrific attacks in Paris just last week. Those are fears. And if we, as harm reductionists and drug policy reformers, and as I would say fundamentally, you know, uh, protagonists for human rights, don't own those fears and address those fears, then we have no chance to succeed. I told the thing at the conference, at our conference last week, I said, uh, years ago when I had first, uh, after I was teaching at Princeton and got that phone call from George Soros that helped me move from academia into activism, and I was encouraged to go see a wise man named Ram Dass. I don't know if you've heard of Ram Dass. He used to be known as Richard Albert. And I went to see Ram Dass, and he basically gave me two pieces of advice. The first one was, Ethan, you got to learn to let go of your attachment to the things for which you're fighting. I had to think about that one for a bit. But as I thought about what I realized is, I think what he was essentially saying was, the struggle you're engaged in and the way you've chosen to spend your life, it's the right one, win or lose. If you go to your deathbed and you didn't have any success, you still did the right thing. Now, of course, it's a lot nicer to win. 
But it meant that in terms of staying steady and people say, how do I keep my spirits up or keep that relentless optimism that Carl talked about? Part of it is knowing that, that win or lose, win or lose, it's the right thing. It's the right way to spend a life. And every one of us, I believe, are spending our lives in the right way by being engaged in this struggle for justice and trying to help people driven by the right sets of values, whether we win or lose. And it should keep us going through the dark periods that are exist right now or that may lie ahead. And the second thing Ram Dass said to me was, Ethan, you got to learn to love William Bennett. Now, for those of you who don't know who William Bennett was, William Bennett was the first American drug czar appointed in 1989. William Bennett was the architect of the modern day drug war, the one who figured out how to play on ordinary Americans' fears around drugs and race and what's happening to their children and advance a reactionary political agenda through that way. William Bennett is, I believe, a truly venal and evil person. And Ram Dass was saying to me, Ethan, you need to learn to love this guy. And I'm like, huh? Really? But I think what Ram Dass was saying was, loving William Bennett, why could he speak and be persuasive to a majority of my fellow Americans at that time? Because he was addressing their fears and he was doing terrible things with them, right? But until we can love and embrace the people who fear what it is we have to say in this moment, until we can own them, until they can see why we're with them, until we, we, how they can see how we are advancing truly the things that they care about, I also don't think we win. We may win for periods of time, but we don't win for good. And that's a really hard struggle. It means talking and being with people who may not share what we just instinctively get or who find it easier to demonize the people that we want to try to help or who we actually are. You know, so part of that, I think, you know, then it comes down to that tactical issue. What does it mean? And once again, I'm not telling you what to do here. I'm just thinking about some of the stuff we've done in the U.S. It goes to language. I hear, you know, the recovery movement is taking over in England. Recovery, you know, with their attachment to abstinence-only models. Recovery is defeating harm reduction. Well, you know what? I am an advocate of recovery. I believe in recovery. I want people to recover. Recovery is good. Recovery from trauma and suffering, addiction, recovery anyway. Recovery taken one step at a time. Recovering, meeting people where they're at, helping people recover. I'm going to own that language of recovery. If that's the language people want to hear and that they want to speak and they can't hear you or listen to you unless you use their language, then use their language, right? Use their language. In the same way that one of the early pioneers of harm reduction in America, Edith Springer, used to go and talk to, you know, abstinence-only audiences, recovery audiences and she would ask them what they were doing and she would talk about talk to people and working in treatment and that and she and they would tell them their stories and she would say she would say darling you're doing harm reduction you just don't even know it well you know what we're doing recovery and they don't even know it we're doing recovery that works and you know what we're all worried about you know people people grasp on it was a Karen showing that slide about child protection right people are child protection they want to you know take away baby child you know we are about child protection. We want to make child protective services work in this country the way they need to work. We want child protective services that keep our children safe. When you see this marijuana legalization campaign in California next year, you know what it's going to be about? Keeping kids safe. Keeping kids safe. Keeping them out of jail, keeping them out of trouble, keeping them out of trouble with drugs. The language we use is so pivotally, pivotally important. I've dealt with in our movement the tensions between harm reduction and drug policy reform. But you know what I oftentimes remember to say at many of our conferences, right? Is I say, you know, I say, grant us, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can and the wisdom to know the difference. My God, if ever there was a beautiful, fantastic prayer, it is that prayer. And quite frankly, I think that is the prayer of the drug policy reform and harm reduction movement as well. 
Because I distinguish fiercely between abstinence and abstinence only, backed by the power of the criminal law. I'll treat anybody who wants abstinence and pursues that as my ally. I'll even embrace the people who insist on abstinence only as long as they don't insist on backing their abstinence only approaches with the power of the criminal law and the power of the state. But it is using that language, that serenity prayer is about the best one there is, and our owning it, our sharing it. I'll tell you, in drug policy reform in the United States right now, people coming from the recovery movement movement are one of the fastest growing elements and through that are learning to embrace broader drug policy reform as well. We gave two of our awards, the, the Randall Award for Citizen Action, the most competitive award we give last week, and we split it among two people. One was Dan Big from Chicago Recovery Alliance, America's pioneer on naloxone. And I love the talk by the fellow from uh, Chris from Northern Ireland because it was, it was inspiring the same way that Dan is. But we gave it to him and about his fight and also to Gretchen Bergman. Gretchen Bergman, the head of a new path, also called Moms United, who has organized parents who have lost their kids to drug addiction or overdose or who have kids really struggling, really struggling, you know, with drug addiction. Right? And they've organized parents, but Gretchen is part of our campaigns to reduce incarceration and to legalize marijuana. Because what those parents know is that the criminalization of marijuana did nothing to help their kids, and the criminalization of other people did nothing to help their kids. It's taking the unlikely voices, the unlikely allies, not just people from law enforcement, and you have some wonderful police in parts of this country stepping up in a good way, as we're beginning to have in America, but it's the parents of people who have lost their their kids as well. You know, anger, anger. What do you do with anger? Black people in America and many other countries have a hugely justified reason to be furious with the way that they are treated in my country and in this country, because you have some of the same issues with racial disproportionality as we do, right? And I hear some of these black people saying, you know, you know, I'll tell you, if only they start locking up white people the same way they're locking up black people, that's when you would see things change. And my sense is, you know what? Might be true. Ain't never gonna happen, right? And saying it, what's it gonna accomplish? How about flipping it around? How about saying, you know what? We want the cops dealing with drugs in our community the same way they're dealing with drugs in those white suburban communities. How about that? How about, you know, white suburban communities, cops aren't paying much attention unless there's a call to the cops and a major problem. And otherwise, the drug dealing and the drug use, it's dealt with in a different way. In our communities, they're looking for it. They're hunting for it. They're nailed for it. That's not the way a civilized society should be. It's thinking about the language we use. Remember the debates we used to have about should we keep the term harm reduction? I always thought it was crazy. Harm reduction is our term. We've got to keep advancing it, legitimizing it, pushing it. But does that mean that we assist on using it even when it's going to be significantly disadvantageous? No, it's our name. It's who we use. But if you want to call me something else and you're calling me something else would help me get where I need to get to help advance the harm reduction values I have, then I will use that language and in that moment. It's about that language. Because, look, so long as we know what our core principles are, we can be as tactical as we need to be. We can embrace who we need to be. We can do what we need to do. What's one of those core principles? I think the most fundamental, core, most civil libertarian, most human rights, most core principle of drug policy reform, it's that basic notion that nobody, but nobody, deserves to be punished simply for what we put in our bodies, absent, absent harm to others. That nobody, that nobody but nobody deserves to be punished or discriminated against or amongst simply because of what we put in our bodies. That there is no legitimate basis in science or medicine or in ethics or for that matter the Bible to distinguish between the person who puts a little uh, alcohol or tobacco in their system in a way that doesn't hurt themselves, or a person who puts cocaine, heroin, or, 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 or meth methylene, or mescaline, or whatever in, in their bodies. And that there is similarly no legitimate basis to distinguish between the person who is addicted or dependent on those substances and the one who is addicted or dependent on those substances. That core principle is the one that we need to keep propagating. That core principle is the one that most people in most societies still do not accept, even though we 
see courts in Latin America and Europe embracing them, even though we see Portugal and other countries beginning to integrate and own those principles. That core principle, going back there, being grounded there, having that principle allows those of us, most of us who are coming from the left, to embrace those who are coming from the right. In both those of us who are active drug users, embracing those of us who are in recovery. And it allows those of us who speak one language with others. Keeping that core principle in mind and then being as expansive as possible, as open as possible to the language we use, the tactics we use, is how you all in England, I believe, I'm not even advising, I'm just reflecting, may actually come out of this dark period you're struggling through to once again become a leader in the world in dealing with drugs. Thank you very much. <laughs>